gin. It used to be a drink made by everyone for everyone, until at least a bunch of elitist politicians came along and thought, mm, no. Actually, we don't want the working class people making so much money. We don't want women being independent. Better put a stop to that. And so the propaganda machine word into action telling everyone how awful gin was and how it was the cause of all the problems in the UK at the time. It was ruining women, apparently. Think like about how Andrew Tate today talks about feminism. That's how people spoke about gin. It was all about how women should be home with the kids and tending to their husbands instead of out having a social life and working. Disgraceful. And so laws were passed, women were put back in their place, and gin became known for the next few hundred years as mother's ruin. The history of gin is actually really, really fascinating, and there is a big feminist twist to it, I guess you could say. And while I was over in Gibraltar for my wonderful sister's wedding, I was lucky enough to visit the Spirit of Rock Distillery, who make their own gins. We did a little gin tasting, we had a little history lesson, we learned all about how gin is made and the fantastic, interesting history of it. It was really incredible. And I personally found myself really fascinated by the feminist side of the history, how gin is so intertwined in the lives of women, how gin gave women a chance to be free and independent and work for themselves, have their own businesses, be these strong, intelligent women who knew what they were doing, until the rich white men decided Nah, can't be having that, can we? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. But we're also going to be doing a little gin tasting and at the end of the video, we're going to be making a cocktail. So I'm very, very excited to be making this video for you guys. Now, disclaimer before we start, I know alcohol isn't for everyone. So if you need to skip this video, not a problem at all, completely understand. But even if you don't like to drink alcohol, I hope that you can at least get something out of the history side of this video and we'll kind of enjoy coming along for the ride and the experience and learning something along the way. And of course, I do have to say, as with everything to do with alcohol, please make sure you drink responsibly, don't overindulge, and if you are underage in whatever country or area you're in, please don't be drinking until it's legal. Thank you. But, without further ado, let's drink some gin! Hi Angel, would baby like to try a gin? Should I just sniff a bottle, see what you think of this? Good girl. Anything interesting? Or would you prefer the Prosecco? Poor Secco. Gin or Prosecco, which one would you like? So as far back as the 15th century, maybe before, distilling gin was always seen as a woman's job. Of course, it wasn't called gin back there, that name didn't come about until much later. But back in the 16th century, here in the UK, we were introduced to a drink called Geneva by the Dutch. This was made from juniper, but was still a little different to the gin we know and love today. Wasn't it, babe? Yes. Dutch army and naval troops were given a tot of Geneva a day as part of their daily rations, and soon this became really popular amongst British soldiers too. During the Thirty Years' War from 1618, Geneva was said to calm the nerves before going into battle. Meanwhile, over in London, people started taking Geneva as medicine to help with problems like indigestion. Throughout the 17th century, Geneva, which proved a little bit of a mouthful for drunk people, and also me when I'm sober, became simply known as a gin. And that's where the taste developed, the drink as we know it today developed, and it grew in popularity at an absolutely crazy rate. Between 1648 and 1710, beer production in the UK fell by 12%, strong beer production fell by 22.5%, but gin production actually rose by 400%. They're as big a fans of gin as you are. <laughs> At the time, water wasn't drinkable, beer was expensive, but gin, gin was accessible, gin was cheap, and usually it wasn't gonna kill you. Let's say relatively safe. <laughs> and now in the UK, everyone was making it, especially women from home. London at the time was growing at a rapid rate. People were travelling from all over the country, all over the world, to come to London to make their fortune. And of course, gin distilling was a great way to do this. You could set up a small gin distillery in your home and make enough gin to make a decent profit, taxes on it were low, laws surrounding it were lax, there were even some other incentives. For example, um, during some years you didn't have to billet soldiers in your home if your home was already being used for distilling gin. Women, mostly working class women to be honest, in London, began to really understand the gin making process and they developed it to become the gin that we're a little bit more familiar with today. 
they understood that when you distill gin, you need to take the head off first. That is when you distill gin, the first 10% or so of liquid that comes out is called the head. And it's incredibly strong and it's incredibly harmful as it contains substances like methanol. So you really don't wanna be drinking that. You need to discard it unless you wanna kill people, you know? After this percentage has moved, basically the rest you can use up until about the last 10% or so, which is usually really weak and can usually be discarded or used for other purposes. The women making gin at the time, they knew this stuff, they understood this stuff, they knew how to make safe gin. They were incredibly smart, incredibly skilled, and they also began to experiment with different flavors, not just using juniper anymore, but adding other things like sugar, licorice, coriander, citrus fruits, both during the distilling process and afterwards and letting the flavors soak in. They were really playing around with different things. And this seems like a great place to take a break and taste our first gin of the video. Now this gin is made by a small independent Leeds-based distillery called Whitewood and when a bottle of this was gifted to me by my friend Ellis who actually makes it and is the genius behind the flavour, this was the gin that made me stop and realise, oh damn, this stuff is good. Before I tried white wood, I always thought gin was just like something to get drunk on. I didn't think it was that nice, I thought it was quite bitter, I always wanted to cover up the taste with lemonade, it was never really my go-to drink of choice. Maybe a pink gin occasionally, I was like, oh, I guess if you put a lot of lemonade in, but then Ellis was like, no, try this, see what you think, and we'll go from there. And I did, and oh my god, is it beautiful. Now, when you're tasting a gin to really try and understand the flavors of it, everyone will have their own way of doing this and tasting it, but the way I've been taught and the way I prefer to do it is to pour out a little bit of gin into a cup and then top it up with water, basically dilute it down. This means you're getting rid of that strong, harsh alcohol taste, but not masking the taste of the gin with anything else. So it really brings out those fruity flavors, those herbs, those spices, those botanicals that go into it, you know? You're really tasting the gin and not the alcohol. So let's have a little bit of this right now. What do you say? Yes. Oh God, it even smells good. Can I smell it? No looking though. <laughs> good girl, what do you think? Is it nice? Yeah, you've seen me drink this before, haven't you? Now, I do have to say a huge thank you to Ellis, who, when I told him I was making this video, and I was like, can I buy a bottle of Whitewood for it, please? Because it will be perfect. And he was like, oh my God, thank you for including it. And he just gifted me this bottle, which is the kindest, most wonderful thing. And he's also offered you guys a discount code if you want to check it out and get a bottle for yourself. So I'll leave that down in the video description and it'll be on screen now. He's not set it, set it up yet at time of filming, but he will. You should be able to get a little bit of money off and try this for yourself and support a really, really amazing small business run by someone who is so passionate and dedicated and really loves what he does and I mean is there a better way to spend your money? Got a little bit here we're gonna dilute it down with some water. You know how sometimes you get an alcohol and all you can smell is just alcohol you know and it just smells bitter and strong. Not this one, this one is so just like fruity, it smells warm, it's sweet but not too sweet. Like, you know me, I've got a massive sweet tooth. I will like always go for the sugary cocktails and stuff like that, but this, it's sweet, but not in a sickly way. I don't think you could ever get tired of this flavor. It's just so nice. So this is Whitewood's Dry Gin, which is a mix of 12 botanicals. <laughs> Hi there. Oh. Hi, Ra baby. You still in the show? Yeah? Good girl. Well done. Good girl. Okay. Now this gin is a mix of, I think it's about 12 different flavors. And obviously it's got the juniper base, but it's also got some really subtle hints of some of my other favorite flavors ever, like lemongrass, which I adore. It's got a really nice warm gingery taste to it. It's got a little bit of um, elderflower, some zesty citrusy flavors. It's got a little bit of lavender in here as well. And one of my favorite elements is they use fennel pollen, which gives it like a very, very slight, subtle, aniseedy sort of flavor. It's really, really good. And the really neat thing about this gin is they don't dilute it down with just plain old water like most gin companies do. They actually dilute it down with birch water, which is kind of amazing. It's a lovely, lovely, delicate flavor that I think is just 
a fantastic modern twist on a classic gin. And that's why I want to share this with you today because not only is it made by a really, really wonderful person who loves the craft of gin making, but it's a stunning, stunning drink as well. I say I like this is perfect to drink just as is, but if you do want to mix it with lemonade, so good. I think a lot of people like to have it with tonic, but I'm not really a tonic fan. Um, but this gin and lemonade, oh my God, it is far too drinkable. It is so good. So yeah, please go support Whitewood. Uh, grab yourself a bottle, have a taste, see what you think, and let me know down in the comments if you do. So, back to the history of gin, and let's talk about the London gin craze. So, as these women are improving the taste of gin, the whole experience of drinking gin is changing and growing, and the gin craze in London explodes. London was wild for gin, kind of like how I am today. By 1730, there were over 7,000 gin shops in London, and by 1733, the average person was drinking 1.3 litres of gin in a week. By 1740, 10 million gallons of gin were being distilled every single year. That is a lot of gin. I don't think even you could drink that much gin, could you? No. She's so tired, she looks drunk. Isn't that right, baby? And the great thing is the love of gin was genderless. For one of the first times in recent British history, men and women were drinking this alcohol together in bars at the same rate as each other. But more than that, so many women were making the gin. Between 1725 and 1750, over a quarter of gin sellers in London were women. This finally gave women the independence they'd been craving, financial and otherwise. They were making their own gin, running their own businesses, starting to leave the working class world they were born into, and they were becoming entrepreneurs. Isn't that right, my little business girl? Boop. And because of this, rates of prostitution were dropping, the numbers of women begging were dropping, and the number of women getting married was dropping. Women were successful without men. The working classes were rising up, and people were loving this new, cheap, accessible drink, and they were having fun with it. The problem was the upper class men did not like this. Not one bit. Something had to be done. Someone had to put these women back in their place. But before we look at that, let's try one more gin. This gin is a little more modern and a little more different and unique than Whitewood's. And this comes from a tiny little independent distillery in Gibraltar called Spirit of the Rock. This distillery is amazing because it's known for making gins using these fantastic locally grown plants that aren't available many other places in the world. The Candy Tuff gin here is named after the Candy Tuff plant. They also have the Campion gin named after the Campion plant. So the type of Candy Tuff which grows specifically in Gibraltar is called, and I haven't pronounced this right, Iberis Gibraltarica, and it is only found growing in mainland Europe in Gibraltar. Me and my partner were lucky enough to actually see it growing in the wild when we hiked the Mediterranean steps and it is a beautiful beautiful plant and they use the seeds of this to help make this gin. We also ended up seeing loads of other plants growing in the wild that they also use for this. For example, carob pods, which you'll see in these photos here that I took. These are the ones where they're kind of new and growing but they're not ripe yet. When they are ripe and ready to be used in gin making or the recipes, they turn this kind of like brown, almost chocolatey sort of colour. This gin is absolutely beautiful and I really, really love it. It wasn't a part of the gin tasting we did, but because I asked about the Candy Tough plant that we'd seen and the gin and things like that, and how they made this gin in particular. The woman who was doing the tour, absolutely wonderful person. She gave me and Kieran a sample to try and we loved it so much, we just had to buy a bottle and bring it home. So I say we open it. I'm gonna get a clean glass for this so we aren't uh, mixing up too many flavors. This one's got a much stronger smell than the Whitewood. I've not had the, well, I mean, obviously, I just got back from Gibraltar last week. I've not tried these together before, like on the same night. So I'm interested to see how different they're gonna be. Oh my god, it's incredible. It's very fruity, but not... I'd say maybe not quite as sweet as the white wood, but it's very, very rich. It's a very modern gin. It's refreshing. You've definitely got a lot of grapefruit in here, orange, peaches, a little lemon. It is quite citrusy, but it's that candy tough plant that just... It's so unique. I've never tasted anything like this, and it's really, really good. You know, I absolutely cannot wait to try this with a lemonade. I'm thinking something like a slightly bitter yellow lemonade. It's gonna be so good with this. Oh, I can't wait. 
So if you'd like to try this gin out for yourself, again, it is from an independent distillery based in Gibraltar. So if you go and buy this, you are supporting a little local business. Um, I am not getting anything at all for promoting these two gins, except a free bottle of Whitewood, but I was gonna pay for that anyway, so. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm not getting anything at all for promoting these. They're just two gins I really, really love. And because they're small independent businesses, I wanna support them. So, so again, if you'd like to try this out for yourself, I'll leave a link down in the video description as well. So back to London, and here's where things start to get a bit darker because the propaganda machine starts to turn and gin is blamed for everything. Rising crime rates, madness, falling birth rates, increased death rates. Women who drank gin were told they were bad mothers, bad wives, bad people. Now, this isn't to say it was entirely made up and that gin had no negative consequences. At the end of the day, it's still alcohol. <laughs> And it did lead to some people having health problems, doing silly or illegal things, high levels of alcoholism amongst the working classes in particular. But let's be honest, those problems existed long before gin was ever around. Gin wasn't to blame for this, but it was an easy scapegoat. Truth is, working class people had it hard. Long working hours for little pay in dirty, dangerous jobs, poor living conditions, poor future prospects, no obvious way out for many. Of course, until they turn to a cheap, readily available means of escape through drinking. The difficult but more helpful long-term solution from the government obviously would have been to provide more social care for the working classes, give them a fair wage, give them decent living conditions, give them health care. But that's too much like hard work, isn't it? The quick, cheap and unhelpful solution, or at least unhelpful to all but the rich, was to demonise gin itself and change the laws. In 1729, the first licence to produce gin was introduced. To make gin now, people had to pay £20 for a licence, and that was a hell of a lot of money back then, the equivalent of around £3,000 today. Plus, they had to pay tax on all the gin that they were selling, and the working classes were doing well from gin, but not that well. No. By 1736, this licensing cost increased even higher to £50, the equivalent of around £8,700 a day. And it was then that the real crackdown happened. People were offered £5 each for every person they turned in who was making gin without a license. And as many couldn't afford licenses, many were convicted, mostly women. Remember how on average 25% of gin sellers in London were women? Well, Nearly 70% of the retailers charged and convicted of selling gin without a license in 1736 alone were women. A disproportionate amount of women were being targeted by these laws and convicted for it. And of course, all were lower and working class women, most of them single. So what happened as a consequence? For the women who weren't arrested, the rest of them kind of went underground and started making illegal gin in secret, which is how we ended up with gins like Old Tom, which would have been dispensed from this kind of cat carving in the wall with a secret password, all very sneaky sneaky. Meanwhile, for the women who were arrested, well, some of them had other people take over their gin selling business, again, underground in secret. But often these were people who didn't understand the gin making process as well as these women did. They forgot to take off the head or maybe they just didn't care because they thought it eat into their profits. They started adding and mixing other things into the gin, not really caring about the flavour. And it was mostly men doing this and all they kept thinking about is how do we make the most profit from this, not how do we create a quality safe product. And because these operations are now underground and more secret and illegal, they could actually get away with doing a lot more or a lot less to the gin. No joke, they ended up mixing things into the gin like turpentine and sulfuric acid. It's no wonder that more and more people began to die and be seriously ill from drinking this crappy, horrible, nasty gin. Hey all, so editing me here, just about to jump in, you're about to hear me say something that makes me sound very, very drunk, despite the fact that at this point in filming I probably had five mil of alcohol. Like, of gin, of work. Oh my god, I'm very tired. Um, I attempt to say the dirty working glasses. It does not come out that way, but that was my intention. Just thought I'd preface this. Enjoy.
Then in 1751, the final big crackdown and change in the laws happened to keep those worky, dirty classes down and end the London gin craze for good. In 1751, William Hogarth was an artist who published two prints titled Gin Lane and Beer Street as part of an anti-gin propaganda movement. This was pushed for by a huge number of politicians, such as Sir Joseph Jekyll, who thought if the lower classes had money and time for, you know, leisure, then this would threaten the entire social order. Oh no, boo, what a shame. Him and his upper class peers couldn't be having that, could they? But of course they couldn't just say this out loud, they couldn't just demonize the poor, who were the majority, let's not forget. So, instead of targeting them and saying get back in your place, they targeted what was making these people money in the first place. Gin. Hogarth's art was a response to this and was used by the government to try and prove to people, see? Look how awful gin is. You shouldn't be drinking this or this will happen to you. Gin Lane was intended to show what happened to those dirty, lowly people who made and drank gin. If you drank gin, people starved. Babies were harmed. There was chaos in the dirty streets. It led to crime and suicide and all sorts of awful stuff. Whereas over here on Beer Streets, well, that's a different story. No, not because beer was heavily taxed by the government and most breweries owned by rich white men. No, no, that's, that's not why Beer Street's good. Beer's better because look how happy and productive it made people. People were working, happy, smiling, fat and full of food and content. Art was being made, books were being read, the streets were safe and clean and orderly because yay beer! Or at least that's what the government wanted us to think. People started to associate any woman who still made and sold gin with criminals, prostitution, spreading STIs, a general lack of respectability. What? Never said I was respectable. A story went around in the newspapers about a woman who tried to sell her baby for a bottle of gin. Another about a woman who abandoned her child because she was too busy drinking gin to remember to take care of it and so on and so on. Now obviously these are bad stories. I'm not condoning selling your baby for a bottle of gin, no matter how good Whitewood is. But no one ever bothered to ask, well, why were these women drinking in the first place? Why did they have so little money? Why were they struggling? Why was no one helping them? Why were they unable to afford a drink so much that they had to sell their baby? Why did they want to escape the world anyway? No one thought to question that, and no one thought to help them. It was way easier to just demonize the gin itself. As around this time, gin became known as mother's ruin. You couldn't possibly be a respectable woman, a good mother, a dutiful wife, if you drank, made, or sold gin. Not at all. And so the propaganda worked. Less and less people started buying gin and drinking gin and making gin. And this also coincided with the 1751 Gin Act, which not only changed the licensing laws again, but made it so the only legal gin stills had to have a capacity of one 800 litres or more. And that is huge. Huge. It meant that the only people who could actually make gin now were ones who had already accumulated enough wealth and property, you know, rich white men, so that they could legally get a license and make gin. You needed to have the money to buy that kind of massive, massive still. You needed to own land to be able to put this still somewhere because it was so big. It completely wiped out the working class gin makers and made it impossible for smaller independent distillers to exist. And it was around this time that the big brands we know today began to take advantage of this situation and dominate the market. Brands like Gordon's Gin, Plymouth Gin and so on. Yeah, they've got a long history, but they got there and they got the success they did today by taking advantage of the working classes. Just like any big business, to be honest. And this law stayed in place for the next 250 or so years with no one challenging it. Well, until Sip Smith, that is. Now this is the last gin we're gonna be trying today and this is Sip Smith's Lemon Drizzle Gin and it is one of my favorite modern flavored gins. I really, really love this. And we're actually gonna be making a cocktail with this in just a moment. But first, the story. In 2007, three friends decided they wanted to make their own gin. They bought themselves these really small, cute little distiller and got to work making their own gin. They were like, we want this to be an amazing flavor. We wanna be an independent gin company. We're gonna do this. And they invested so much time and money and energy and passion into this only to be stopped 
because it was illegal. There still was only 300 litres, and while that's still quite big, it's nowhere near the legal requirement of 1,800. This law from the 1700s was still in place and still stopping smaller independent people making a living. And so the Sipsmith guys petitioned and they petitioned and they petitioned and they petitioned and they petitioned some more and finally this outdated law was changed in the UK in 2008. The friends were finally able to make their own gin which you may recognize today as Sipsmith. There's now so many different flavors and kinds of Sipsmith available. You'll find it in most big supermarkets. It's now got to be a pretty big gin, all because these three guys decided they wanted to change the laws together. It's thanks to these guys that companies like Whitewood and Spirit of the Rock are able to make their own gin and sell it today. It's the reason why we're able to have small independent distilleries, all thanks to Sipsmith. This gin is such an important part of our history in the UK and I think it deserves a little bit of recognition. And so, Let's open this up and make a little cocktail with this today. This is a really, really fun cocktail that we're going to be making. It's a twist on the French 75, but a lemon drizzle French 75 because lemon, of course. So I have got a little cocktail shaker. We're going <laughs> to... Sorry, baby bean. <laughs> I'm so sorry, baby. Did that scare you? It's just a lid. You can smell it if you want. I'm so sorry, Angel. So we've got a cocktail shaker. We are gonna pop a little bit of ice in here in a moment before we start shaking. Don't worry, I'm not gonna shake on camera. I'm gonna try and keep everything as quiet as possible. Um, but we are gonna start with, so we're gonna start with 35 ml of the Sipsmith Lemon Drizzle Gin. I love how this smells. I feel like this one smells a lot more alcohol than the others, but, oh, you've got that lemony, citrusy smell in there. It's so good. We are gonna take 10 ml of a simple sugar syrup. This is, of course, non-alcoholic. It literally just makes the cocktail really, really sweet and nice. I would say if you do like a little sweeter, don't be afraid to put a tiny bit more of that in. We're also gonna squeeze 20 ml of fresh lemon juice. So let's do that now. And now I'm gonna go and fill this up with some ice, give it a good shake, and I'll be right back. All right, we're gonna take a strainer, drain this into a glass, top it up with a little Prosecco. This is one of my favorite Proseccos. It is the Freaksen, Freaksenet Prosecco. I do not know how you say this, but it always tastes really, really good. This is one of my favorite ones to get Daisy as a gift because it's just so, so tasty, isn't it, Bean? Ooh, you're gorgeous. Kyra's running because she hates the pop of um, like Prosecco bottles and champagne bottles and stuff like that. If you do want to be fancier, you can make this with champagne, but <laughs> not that rich. Ooh, there we go. You're safe, Gooby Bear. You're good, baby. And there, you have your French 57 lemon drizzle cocktail. Enjoy. Oh my god, it's so good. Oh, I'm going to be drinking this all night. I have another video to film straight after this, and I can tell you, I'm going to be having one of these with me while I do it. So keep an eye out for that. <laughs> oh my god, it's amazing. It's like lemonade, but better. <laughs> Alright, and with that, with our lovely little cocktail, if you made this along with me, let me know how your drink is. Um, but with this, we are going to end this video today. I really, really hope you enjoyed this and learned something along the way. And if you go out and try any of these gins for yourself, please let me know what you thought of them down in the comments. Um, I just want to end finally by extending a huge thank you in particular to Ellis who provided me the Whitewood gin for this video, the Candy Tuft I bought for myself, the Sipsmith I bought for myself and all that, but the Whitewood I really do need to thank Ellis for. And I also want to extend a thank you to everyone at the Spirit of Rock Distillery in Gibraltar for inspiring this video in the first place. If you would like to find out a little bit more about gin in general, I'll leave some interesting links down in the video description and also a couple of book suggestions you can check out if you want. They're ones that helped me in researching and writing this video script, so they're really great. And of course, there'll be links to all the gin in the description as well. The Sipsmith one is an affiliated link through Amazon, so if you do buy that gin, I just get a couple of pound for my channel, like if, if that. It just kind of helps support me and my work and helps me keep making videos like this. But the Whitewood and Candy Tough gins are not sponsored or affiliated or anything like that. But if you do buy from them, you're helping independent small businesses who have a real passion and love for what they do. And I think that's a really wonderful thing to do. So please, please go check them out. But for now, thank you for watching. I'm gonna be enjoying my cocktail and I'll see you all again very soon.